Thank you. It's always refreshing to be wrong. Not pleasant, but refreshing. Like a bucket of ice water wakes you up, makes you think about things differently. So I always thought solar power was an crucial piece of the long-term energy landscape, but I thought it wasn't going to happen soon at economic scale. In 2008, I worked with a bunch of colleagues at Carnegie Mellon to do an expert elicitation of a bunch of the top PV experts, and together, we estimated there was about a 50-50 chance of getting to 30 cents a watt module prices by 2030. And you really have to get module prices down to about 30 cents a watt to really make commodity solar power. A few years later, with another colleague, I worked on analysis showing that the learning curve for solar PV had flattened out. We were totally wrong. In practice, we're going to hit that 30 cents a watt target next year, 10 years earlier than we predicted. Cheap solar is real. It is stunning. And I think it is the most important good news about climate of the 30 years I've worked on the climate energy problem. I also think it'll be one of the defining things about the commercial energy landscape this century. I'm talking about massive solar power plants, like this over two gigawatt plant in North India. I could not have imagined in 2008 that there would be an over two gigawatt plant in North India by uh, 2019. But while solar power is enormously cheap, while costs, I think, will keep going down, while I think it is very realistic that we will get costs below $10 a megawatt hour for lo great locations sometime soon after 2030, this will not magically decarbonize the world, not even if the power is free. That's because it's still only there during the day and it depends on locations. Decarbonization is hard. Where we can easily electrify things, we will, and it will work well. But you can't decarbonize everything. You can't easily electrify everything with batteries. Take aviation. Aviation depends in a fundamental way, as you've heard in earlier talks, on energy density. The gap between batteries and fuels for energy density is at least a factor of 20, even being charitable. And while innovation will for sure improve the costs of batteries and improve the lifetime of batteries, making really deep improvements in the energy density, I think requires us to invent new chemical elements, which means it's not going to happen. We're not going to bridge that gap by innovation alone. So how do we solve the problem of decarbonizing the parts of the energy system that want fuels, that want high energy density carriers? I think a crucial answer is to make fuels out of the air, to use cheap, eventually too cheap to meter, solar PV during the sunny parts of the day to turn it into fuels which are high energy density, easy to store, and easy to transport, ideally into hydrocarbon fuels which are compatible with existing infrastructures. So let's say you want to do that. Let's say you want to start with solar PV and go to fuels. First thing you need is you need CO2 that you got from the atmosphere. If you don't get it from the atmosphere, you cannot have the life cycle carbon emissions be zero. So my company, the company I founded, Carbon Engineering, is one of the leaders in developing these technologies. And I think we and others have clearly shown this is doable in the industrial world. Just a few weeks ago, Carbon Engineering announced that we are now financing a million ton a year plant. So this is the beginning of real industrial reality. We have already begun funding the front-end engineering design feed study for that plant. So we are a long way down the road of getting detailed engineering in a sense that, that we think we really understand our costs. A big chunk of the innovation behind carbon engineering was in fact not to innovate. It was to every way we could use existing commercial technologies and combine them in new ways to produce this new service. Um, we think it is very realistic to get to costs of order $100 a ton CO2 from the atmosphere and energy use of five or six gigajoules a ton CO2. Then you need hydrogen. You need to split water to make hydrogen if you're going to make fuels. This is also a commodity process and one where there is enormous innovation happening right now. This, for example, is a now old 25 megawatt facility installed by Nels in Indonesia actually to make polysilicon, and polysilicon is mostly going to be used to make solar PV. 
Um, but as you begin to talk to suppliers in this market, what's clear is either for um, al old alkaline technologies like you see here, although the old ones are changing pretty fast, or for PEM, proton exchange membrane technologies, there is real room for industrial innovation in uh, electrolysis driven by all the new demand, driven by so-called e-fuels. And so talking to suppliers like Nels, we are convinced that we will see real-world delivered CapEx costs of under $500 a KW soon, like mid-2020s. And there's lots of reason to believe it can go beyond that. Multiple suppliers tell us, and this doesn't depend on some laboratory innovation in science or nature. This is scaling what people know how to do. So then you also need carbon monoxide, because the carbon monoxide and hydrogen are going to go together and make syn fuels, which for the next step. And there are ways that are low risk to make CO. We know we can do it by something called reverse water gas shift. But we know the best way is electrochemical, to directly turn to reduce CO2 into CO. That's always been possible technically, but now it's also commercial reality. In the last couple of years, Haldor Tropso has brought to the real market actual commercial, what they call ECOS technology, uh, electrolytic CO based on high temperature fuel cell technologies. They've entered production in 2018. They're still only at 300 kilowatts for these units, but when you talk to them, when you talk to other people in this market, there seems no reason that they can't scale these things up to substantial technical scale. So you've got hydrogen, you've got carbon monoxide, we call that syn gas in the uh, uh, gas to liquids uh, industry, and gas to liquids is just what it sounds like, a commercial process for taking that combination and turning it into liquid hydrocarbons, which can then be refined into regular products, into aviation kerosene, jet fuel, into uh, gasoline, into diesel. That technology is old and is absolutely vanilla. We know how to do that. This is a shell plant in the Gulf that's 140,000 barrels a day. There's no mystery about GTL. We know how to do it, and it is surprisingly efficient. The LHV, low heating value, and the end efficiency of, of a modern plant like that can be 80%. So there are a lot of academics looking at much cleverer ways to do this, but the good old-fashioned ways can really work. So let's put some numbers in it. And these are not numbers that come from academic papers. These are numbers that come from us working with suppliers, with existing things that can be bought at the market at scale. This is to produce one gigajoule of fuel, call it 30 liters. This is a lot of numbers. Let me simplify it a little bit. Let's go to efficiencies. This shows you, the first of all, the end-to-end -end efficiency of turning electricity into fuel, 44% for these particular set of numbers. On the one hand, you should think that's terrible. Batteries, after all, have round-trip efficiencies easily of 90%. Uh, but I think the big lesson is that round-trip efficiency is not all that matters. As solar PV gets really, really cheap, the ability to take it and make a fuel, which is easy to store for years in huge quantities, easy to transport with existing infrastructure, that is huge, and that can, in some markets, trump the efficiency disadvantage. Plus, there are ways that we can certainly improve on that. This is all with existing technologies. People can figure out how to do better. This shows you the breakdown of the different energy uses in that plant. So you need about half of the total electricity to make hydrogen, about a third of it to make the CO. And in this particular version, about 17% is what we need for carbon engineering to do the CO2 from the air. That reflects something a lot of people have worried that our plant, carbon engineering's plant, is too energy intensive. We deliberately designed it not to focus on energy efficiency, but to focus on low technical risk and low capital cost. And I think this kind of breakdown shows you that our energy use is not the big deal. Yeah, we could be a little bit better, but what really matters is cost. We're interested in bringing this to market at commercial scale in the real world. So let's think about what the 44% means when you turn it into energy units and do the math. That means when we get to $10 a megawatt solar, and it's going to happen. We can argue if it's 2030 or 2035, whatever. That means that, that, that the cost of that solar electricity would only contribute something like 27 cents a liter to fuel. Now, of course, overall fuel costs are going to be higher than 27 cents a liter. So currently, uh, our carbon engineering system would contribute about 20 cents to those costs. And based on current or emerging uh, uh, technologies, we think it's reasonable to bring uh, air to fuels to market at something like a dollar a liter in the mid 2020s. But even if we're a little higher than that, in the long run, these are all commodity technologies and the prices can just go down as solar PV gets cheaper, as these electrolytic technologies get cheaper, as people find new ways to do this. 
I am talking here about an energy pathway, not about a particular technology. I've talked a little bit about our technology, carbon engineering air capture, but there will be others. This is about an energy pathway to take intermittent solar and turn it into something that is storable, to deal with the intermittency problem and to deal with it in a way that allows you to power high energy density needs around the world, allows you to fly airplanes across the North Atlantic. So people will no doubt find clever ways to do this. Laboratories all over the world have clever people thinking about beautiful things like uh, um, artificial leaves that can do all the stuff I said in one magic step. Some of these will eventually work out. But I think the big news here is that this could be done with commodity hardware starting soon. If the world really wants to decarbonize, and we really need to decarbonize if we want a stable climate, if the world really wants to decarbonize, you could get to something like a million barrels a day of, of air to fuels, synthetic hydrocarbon capacity, I think soon after 2030. After that, there is no obvious scaling limit. There's no reason this couldn't expand to be tens of millions of barrels a day to basically take the part of transportation demand that cannot be easily electrified. We all think about light duty vehicles, about cars. Electric cars are absolutely going to happen, but cars are only half of global transportation demand. And there are lots of things outside transportation where electrification is very hard. We need to solve the fuels problem as well as solving electrification. This is a realistic pathway to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you.